articles today uh, that I posted on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, and also the press conference that um, President Joe Biden gave today, the speech President Joe Biden gave today. We posted that on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network. There was a uh, good article that I saw from uh, blackamericaweb.com today by uh, Bruce C.T. Wright for Black America Web. He also writes for uh, newsone.com. And this deals with the racist legacy of January 6th, the racist legacy of January 6th. Uh, Even though the Capitol rioters, the insurrectionists wanted to stop Joe Biden from being president, the motivation, their motivation was largely rooted in anti-black racism. Their motivation was largely rooted in anti-black racism. So we're going to talk some about that on today's show. Uh, and in a lot of the coverage that I was watching in mainstream media, this is something that was not really focused on as much as I think it should be focused on. Uh, also, uh, we're going to share some excerpts of comments from uh, President Joe Biden today and Vice President Kamala Harris. Then there was a um, so I've been mon- I've been watching this all day today, reading different articles, uh, some good information from the Washington Post and New York Times on this as well that we'll discuss. There was a uh, on Deadline White House today on um, MSNBC Nicole Wallace's show. Deadline White House. Um, she had uh, on her show uh, Dr. Donnell Harbin, Dr. Donnell Harbin. And uh, Dr. Donnell Harbin is an African American man. He's the former chief of Homeland Security and Intelligence for Washington, D.C. And he had been warning officials about an insurrection. That could take place like what took place on January 6th. He, he warned them that something like that could happen on January 6th. But his his warnings largely fell on deaf ears. And I, I, I saw him uh, on Wednesday on MSNBC. I, I can't remember who show he was on, but he was on Deadline White House today. And, and, and I've known about him. I've seen articles where he was quoted, et cetera, even before today. So we're going to talk about that. All right. Now, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's corrects wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the covers of his or her actions. Because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for the online history classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Now, also, um, at, at toward the end of today's show, there's a story from uh, November 17th, 2021, and I, I hadn't been able to talk about this. It kept slipping my mind. But in Egypt, archaeologists say they have found a 4,500 year old sun temple, a 4,500 year old sun temple uh, in Egypt. OK, so we'll talk about that at the uh, end of the day show as well. Okay, so I, I want to jump into uh, the, this first topic. And then when we come back from the break, we're going to let you hear uh, some comments from President Joe Biden. And, and Joe Biden called out the lies of Donald Trump and these, uh, uh, these cowardly uh, Republicans who keep pushing the big lie. And they're pushing these voter restriction bills across the country based upon the big lie. And this is an example of how elections have consequences. And those that listen to this show 
they know back in 2016, I months before the presidential election in 2016, I warned people about Donald Trump and how dangerous Donald Trump would be. And I warned people that Trump had to be stopped. This wasn't about personalities and who you liked. Understanding history, when you have somebody propagating lies like Trump, and you had somebody who had the platform and tens of millions of followers on social media, that is extremely dangerous. That is extremely dangerous. All right. So uh, this piece here from uh, BlackAmericaWeb.com by Bruce C.T. Wright, uh, the racist legacy of January 6th. Yes, Capitol rioters wanted to stop Joe Biden from becoming president, but the motivation was also largely rooted in anti-black racism. The motive, their motivation, stoked by the traitor in chief, Benedict Donald, and other Republicans, but led by, by led by Benedict Donald, the the nation was rooted in anti-black uh, racism. Okay, so if we look at this piece here, I'm gonna close out these ads. Um, so it starts out saying, considering the mounting opposition to critical race theory, it's important to put uh, January 6th, uh, the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol in the proper perspective, proper historical perspective, and document the, the decidedly racist elements that helped fuel the riots and define that moment's legacy. OK, so then they go on to uh, lay out some information about January 6th. OK, uh, the purpose of the so-called Stop the Steal rally, the purpose of the so-called Stop the Steal rally was to prevent Congress from certifying Joe Biden's presidential election based on the big lie. OK, that non-existent voter fraud played a role in his victory over Donald uh, in his uh, in uh, Joe Biden's victory over Donald Trump. Now, Biden addressed that in today's speech, and we'll let you hear that on the other side of the break. OK, and there was no widespread voter fraud. There was some uh, anecdotal voter fraud. Uh, uh, most of the time it was Trump supporters voting twice. Imagine, isn't it strange that Donald Trump doesn't that at all? You had Trump supporters voting twice, but it was a handful of them. OK, now um, you have racist. Um, so. That non-existent voter fraud played a role in his victory over Donald Trump, a, a racist whose rhetoric is being blamed for helping to incite the rioters. But if you peel back a few layers of that racist onion, you might recall how Trump falsely blamed how Trump falsely blamed states with significant African-American voting populations that provided the deciding Electoral College votes to secure Biden's win. Georgia, for instance, is largely credited with pushing uh, uh, Joe Biden past the finish line, thanks in no small part to the devoted legion of black organizers who mobilized voters across the state to cast their ballots against Benedict Donald, who also blamed African-American election workers under false pretenses. And one of them he named numerous times when he tried to shake down uh, 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 Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger and put pressure on him to find 11,781 votes to manifest this, okay? So Trump could steal the election in Georgia. Now, this was the basis of Benedict Donald energizing, uh, uh, the basis of uh, energizing uh, uh, Donald Trump's base to, to act on his behalf to avenge his loss, loss in the most disingenuous way by blindly parroting the claim that he was cheated out of being reelected with the help of African Americans, and then what 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 these uh, Republicans are doing in state legislatures across the country, and it started with Senate Bill Two Hundred One, I think it was in Georgia, and is backed by dark money like the Heritage Project that's led by Jessica Anderson. What they're doing now is what Democrats did during Jim Crow in southern state legislatures to suppress the african-american vote we're going to see this on the other side of the break you listen to the african history network show i'm michael m hotel we'll be back in a few minutes 
All right, stand by, stand by. One commercial break, back from break in four minutes. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. Um, who needs to, uh, who's, who still needs to register for the online classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Uh, you can still register for that class and this helps support the African History Network. Uh, you're going to learn a lot in these classes, number one, but this helps support us and stay on the air, uh, keep broadcasting, keep doing the research, etc. cetera. Um, African-American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. We'll let you know um, how you can advertise with the African History Network. We have three new uh, advertising programs uh, to help you. Okay, let's see here. Stand by. Okay, I'll be on Roller Martin Unfiltered on Friday. Okay, how's everybody doing? Okay, how you doing, Stefan? Um, if you all want to support the African History Network, dollar a sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar a sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Stand by. Back from breaking two minutes. We're going to post the information here to register for the class also. Um, where are the black business owners today? Post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Stand by. Back from breaking two minutes. Okay, here's the information to register for the online classes. Uh, and we'll be in class on Sunday. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. It's a 10-week online course I teach. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Uh, the class is regularly $130 on sale, $60 right now. We have a bundle pack where you can register for both classes for only um, $70. It's regularly $260. That's for a very limited time only. 910, the Superstation, Detroit's only African American talk radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show, right here. Welcome back to the African History Network show, right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Thursday, January 6, 2021, and we are live. Be sure to visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for the online courses that I teach on Saturdays and Sundays dealing with history. On Sundays, is ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And then uh, we do that Saturday, uh, Sundays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do it thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Uh, so next class is Sunday, January 9th. And then uh, Saturdays, we do uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. So a lot of these things dealing with the Civil War, Reconstruction, we deal with in this class. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. We also have a bundle pack. Uh, we can register for both classes for only $70. They're normally uh, $260 for both classes, okay? So that's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com right on the homepage. All right, uh, I want to go back to uh, our, our lead story. This deal, this is dealing with the uh, commemoration of the January 6th insurrection. And there's a good article today from BlackAmericaWeb.com uh, called The uh, Racist Legacy of January 6th. The Racist Legacy of January 6th. Uh, we're going to go back to that. And then uh, in a minute here, Kevin, we're going to go to uh, President Joe Biden, an excerpt from his speech today as well. Now, uh, something else that 
Um, I, I was so I read a little, you know, I read Washington Post, New York Times every day. This is, I, I monitor about 35 different news sources daily. There was a uh, uh, an article that um, uh, came out today, and it dealt with how uh, corporations donated millions of dollars to lawmakers who voted to overturn election results. Now, I'm going to be on Roland Martin at Unfiltered again uh, tomorrow on Friday. Uh, I'm a panelist every Friday, usually on Roland Martin Unfiltered. We haven't been on the past couple of Fridays because of the holidays. If you watch me on Roland Martin Unfiltered, if you watch this show, I've been saying that we have to hold uh, not just Joe Biden accountable, but the other entities. We have to hold these corporations accountable who put out statements, who, who signed on signed on to a letter back in uh, July 14th, July of 2021, uh, saying that they supported the, the uh, John Lewis Voting Rights Act. But now all of a sudden they have uh, uh, laryngitis and amnesia. OK, and. With, with these bills being passed, 19 uh, voter restriction bills, uh, oh, sorry, um, 19 states have passed 33, it's about 33 voter restriction bills. Th these corporations have been silent, okay? So this piece right here, see, all this is connected. All this is connected together. And, and as, I, as I said, as I warned people in 2020, in 2016, leading up to the 2016 presidential election, this is not about one person. This is about an ideology, and a lot, of, a lot of this is tied to the fear of the browning of America. A lot of this is tied to the fear of the, of the browning of America. The change in, in, in uh, uh, is a fear of the change in the culture of this country, and there's a fear that some white people have, not all white people, but there's a fear that some white people have that they will, by, by the year 2043, they will be a minority population in this country. And many of those people saw Donald Trump as the great white hope. They saw Donald Trump as their last hope. OK, and Trump was talking about Supreme Court not, uh, justices and uh, uh, having a, a, a conservative Supreme Court. He was talking about federal judge, uh, uh, fe uh, federal uh, judge uh, positions. OK, and these are lifetime appointments. Now, this article came out today. From the New York Times, and the New York Times has some really, really good reporting on January 6th, okay, in different aspects of it. Corporations donated millions to lawmakers who voted to overturn election results. One year after the Capitol riot, many businesses resumed corporate donations to lawmakers who voted against certifying the 2020 election. Now, there's 147 of these traitors. Traders Republicans in the House of Representatives that voted not to certify the presidential election. OK, and what they're doing, they and these are people who are trying to invalidate the African-American vote. Now, many of these corporations who are financing these people, OK, these traders, they get the, the many of these corporations we spend money with. There has to be an ultimatum put to them. This cannot be an issue of Republicans buy Coca-Cola also. Republicans buy Nike also. Republicans ship through Amazon also, whatever the corporation. This, 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 this can't be a both sides issue. It's very simple. Either you tell these people to stop passing these voter restriction bills and stop trying to invalidate the votes of African Americans and suppress the votes of African Americans, Latinos, college students, white women, things like this. Either you tell them to stop or you're going to withdraw economic support from them. If you do not withdraw economic support from these people who are voting against our own interests, then we are going to withdraw economic support from you. Period. There's that there, there, there's not a both sides here. There's not a there's good people on both sides. No, we cannot continue to finance our own dehumanization. And this is what I've been saying on Roller Martin Unfiltered, because when I, I, I love and respect everybody who's out marching and protesting, but the people who march and the protesting are not talking about largely putting economic pressure on these corporations. And so they're marching and protesting in the spirit of Dr. King, 
and John Lewis and things like this and the Voting Rights Act, all this stuff. Now, a couple things. We're going to get back to January 6th. All this is connected. The John Lewis Voting Rights Act is connected to this. When you when you go look at the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965, the last time the Voting Rights Act was renewed in the U.S. Senate was 2006. You know what the vote was in 2006 to renew the Voting Rights Act? 98 to zero. The vote in the U.S. Senate was 98 to zero. It got overwhelmingly su overwhelming support by both Democrats and Republicans. It was not a partisan issue. It's, be, it's a partisan issue because of this traitor, Benedict Donald, who's propagating the big line. So all this stuff is connected. OK, so if we look at this here. And let me go back to. Uh, OK, let's go back to this one right here. All this is connected. At its annual summit on the state of American business last January, January 2020, officials from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce expressed disgust at the siege on the U.S. Capitol that had unfolded days earlier and declared that lawmakers who discredited, they declared that lawmakers who discredited the 2020 election would no longer receive the organization's financial backing. Okay. These are officials from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Okay. Um, quote, uh, Neil Bradley, executive vice president and chief policy officer for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, said, quote, there are some members who by their actions will have forfeited the support of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, period, full stop. OK, now he said this. Uh, this is what he said back in January 2020. Less than two months later, the nation's the, the nation's biggest lobbying group reversed course. Quote, we do not believe it is appropriate to judge members of Congress solely based on their votes on the electoral certification. Ashley Rich Stevenson, the chamber's senior political strategist, wrote in the memo. Oh, really? Wait a second. They're not trying to invalidate the, 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 the races that Republicans won. R Republicans in the House of Representatives picked up House seats. They're not trying to invalidate votes in those elections. They're only trying to go after the presidential election that they lost. So, yeah, we do not believe it is appropriate to judge Congress solely based on their votes on electoral certification. I think it is because when you listen to their argument, number one, they're not providing any evidence Two, there were 61 court cases. All these challenges, Rudy Giuliani and, 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 and all, all these attorneys, all these Republican attorneys, all those cases basically were thrown out except for one. One, they won in, in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania. And that dealt with how close poll workers could be to poll watchers, how, how close poll watchers could be to poll workers. All those other cases were thrown out because they weren't providing evidence of widespread voter fraud. So when you got 147 traders in the House of Representatives, Republicans, who vote not to certify the election, and many of them won their House races, okay, and they're not claiming fraud in, their, in the House races they won, and, and, and Joe Biden and, and Trump were on the same ballot in the race that they won? No, get out of here with that nonsense. In the years since the riot at the Capitol, the attempted insurrection at the Capitol, because it wasn't just a spontaneous riot. No, this was planned. Now, there were some people who got caught up in it. But no, this was planned. This was well detailed and organized. And this is what the January 6th committee is exposing. In the years since the riot at the, the insurrection at the Capitol, many corporate giants and trade groups have moved from making stern statements about the sanctity of democracy to reopening the financial spigot for lawmakers who undermine the election. They try to overthrow the government. These are traitors. They're financing traitors who try to overthrow the government. This is what it is. Now, you can dress it up however you want to say it. OK, but this is basically what it is. Millions of dollars in donations continue to flow to watchdog groups, deri uh, watchdog groups ride as the sedition caucus, highlighting how quickly political realities shift in Washington. So 
these are corporations that have to be held accountable. We'll deal with this on the other side of the break, and we'll talk about the um, uh, the racist legacy of January 6th as well. We'll let you hear from President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris on the other side of the break. Listen to the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right, stand by. Stand by. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on you know, social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. Stand by. Okay. Um, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal. PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. Stand by. Back from breaking four minutes. Stand by, everybody. Okay. Um, here's the information for the online course uh, I, I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. We have a special bundle pack. The history classes, we have a special bundle pack. You can register for both uh, classes. They're on sale $70 right now. Uh, for both of them, regularly $130 each. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Stand by. All right, stand by. Let's see here. Okay, email us at AHN show at African History Network.com. AHN show at African History Network.com. Uh, and we'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. 910, the Superstation, Detroit's only African American talk radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Thursday, January 6, 2021. Now, this is a different type of conversation uh, about the January 6 insurrection instigated by Benedict Donald and Rudy Giuliani and Donald Trump Jr. A lot of these people propagating the big lie. There's a different conversation that, uh, here that, that you will get other places. Uh, I just want to go back quickly here to this article here from the New York Times, because all of this is connected. We have to do a systems analysis as opposed to uh, dealing with a paralysis of analysis. OK, now, this article that came out today from the New York Times. Corporations donated millions to lawmakers who voted to overturn election results. OK, in January 2020, they said they were going to stop donating to these these the, uh, these traders. OK, but then a couple months after that, then they started opening back up the pocket pocketbooks. Now, a report published this week by Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, a nonprofit watchdog group, showed how corporate money continue to support most of the 147 lawmakers who voted to overturn the election results. They, they, they voted to disenfranchise African-American voters, Latino voters, etc. But African-American voters get the brunt of the target. Now, in the last year, in 2020, I'm sorry, 2021, in the last year, 717 companies and industry groups gave more than 18 million dollars 
to 143 of the 147 traders who voted to invalidate to overturn election results 717 companies and industry groups gave more than 18 million dollars to 143 of the 147 the dirty 147 lawmakers now businesses that pledged to stop or pause their donations to those lawmakers have since given nearly 2.4 million dollars directly to their campaigns or leadership political action committees according to uh crew the uh, uh, uh citizens for responsibility and ethics in washington many of the corporations that have donated are household names including boeing pfizer general motors ford motor company at&t and ups Trey, all of these people need i don't i don't care who I don't care who show they advertise on. I don't care how much money these corporations give to HBCUs or donate to black charities, what have, have you. This is not a both sides issue. This is not a Republicans buy Ford cars. Republicans use AT&T internet service and cell phones also. This is either you for domestic terrorists, either you for these traders, either, either you for these people who try to invalidate, to, try to overthrow the government, either you for them or you against them, one or the other. If you continue, we have to put an ultimatum. This is about self-preservation. We can't deal with self-determination for seven days during Kwanzaa and go back to going to sleep and being a Negro the rest of the year. That's not even logical. That's not logical. All of these corporations have to be exposed. All of these corporations have to be exposed. Okay. You can't on the one hand. Now it'd be different if they said, if, if, if they said from the beginning, well, no, we're not going to stop donating. We're just going to keep doing it. That'd be different. I still disagree with them donating, but at least, you, at least you ain't say you're going to stop. OK, at least you didn't say what sounded good when the cameras are in your face and then in darkness, you start opening up your pocketbooks and donating to these to these people again who are trying to disenfranchise the vote. And suppress African-American votes, Latino votes, college students, etc. There was a there was an article from. Um, there was there was one from July 14th from NBC News. And this dealt with 150 companies, more than 150 companies back, uh, back update to Voting Rights Act. OK, see, like I said, all of this stuff is connected. OK, all of this is connected. More than 150 companies back update to Voting Rights Act. Major businesses like PepsiCo, Macy's, Ikea and Nestle USA signed on to a letter supporting the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Now, I guarantee you, Dr. King Day, January 17th, Dr. King Day, you're going to have a lot of these corporations putting out statements. We love Dr. King, all this stuff. They said, wait a second, why are you financing people who are trying to dismantle Dr. King's legacy and John Lewis's legacy? Read this article. I talked, I talked about this a couple weeks ago on uh, Roller Martin Unfiltered about three weeks ago now because past two fridays we weren't on because it was uh it wasn't on because um of the holidays july 14th 2021 more than 150 companies including pepsico amazon and target threw their support behind updating the voting rights act in a letter released on wednesday and this is this is in july 2021 the signatories all u.s employers urged congress to enact the john lewis voting rights act legislation that will restore a key provision of the 1965 law that was stripped out by the supreme court in the supreme court case of shelby county versus holder that that uh uh attorney general jeff sessions uh, donald trump's first attorney general he jumped for joy and he was happy when uh the supreme court gutted section five of the voting rights act because shelby county is in alabama alabama's ground zero for the voting for the fight for the voting rights act and where was where was uh jeff sessions u.s senator from alabama and that's who donald trump picked as his first attorney general a man who was deemed too racist to be a federal judge back in 1986 when he was up for a federal judgeship 
he was deemed too racist to be a federal judge. This is who Trump picked as his as his attorney general. I told you, told you this is about more than one person. But you had to understand history and politics to understand this. Now, the bill would again buy jurisdictions with a history of discrimination to get permission from the Department of Justice to make changes to their elections using an updated formula to determine those jurisdictions. The letter made no mention of Republican efforts to tighten voter rules across the country after Benedict Donald's uh, election laws, focusing, focusing instead on deep inequities exposed by the 2020 contest in how our elections are run. Quote, despite decades of progress, impediments to exercising the right to vote persist in many states, especially for communities of color. We need federal protections to safeguard this fundamental right for all Americans. The letter obtained by NBC News said, well, in, in the Zillow, Microsoft, Pepsi, Google, Hershey's, Cisco, not Cisco with Drew Hill, Cisco, the, the software company, Cisco, not that Cisco. OK, <laughs> not the thong song, Cisco. OK, Best Buy, Amazon, Apple, all of them, Starbucks, all of them signed on to this. It sounded real good. OK, but but y'all have laryngitis and amnesia now. How did that happen? Read, read the rest of this article here because we run out of time. I don't have time to get through all this. But all of this is connected. This is all connected to January 6th. Because the reason why you definitely need the Freedom to Vote Act and John Lewis Voting Rights Act is because of the voter restriction bills, over 400 being pushed by Republicans, financed by dark money groups like Heritage Action that are being pushed through Republican-dominated state legislatures based on the big lie. The big lie was used to orchestrate and engineer and incite the January 6th insurrection. This is all connected. So let's go back to um, let's go back to the first story we went to, and we're going to talk about this some more on our Sunday show. Sunday we had two hours, um, and I'm working on so much in trying to take care of the responsibilities of the the, uh, the African History Network and things like this. Um, but we'll deal with this some more on our Sunday show when we have two hours. Okay, so back to this excellent article from. Um, Bruce C.T. Wright, Bruce C.T. Wright for BlackAmericaWeb.com. It's African-American owned and operated. The racist legacy of January 6th. With that seed planted, the seed of the big lie and targeting African-Americans, uh, targeting uh, African-American uh, organizers like uh, uh, Stacey Abrams, voting rights organizers, things like this, and then African-American uh, election workers as well, targeting them under false pretenses. This was the basis of energizing Trump's uh, base who are largely uneducated and ignorant. A lot of them, never, many of them never read the U.S. Constitution, don't understand it, any of this stuff, okay? Some of them know better, but some of them are just, just dumb and just easy to manipulate. They sit up and watch Fox News all day and listen to the My Pillow guy, things like this. By blindly parroting the claim that Trump was cheated out of being reelected with the help of African-Americans. With that seed planted, it was no wonder the Capitol riots, the Capitol insurrection unfolded the way they did with white privilege at the forefront. OK, now. So they go through talk about uh, uh, police uh, reactions and responses and uh, the N word being thrown and uh, um, uh, black Capitol officers have recounted their treatment of riot uh, treatment by rioters, including being called the N word. Then they go through and uh, uh, to talk about, OK, the privilege of white supremacy. Uh, all of that. And there's another part in here. OK, only about 60 rioters were arrested on January 6, 2021, while nearly the same number of police officers were injured, including one officer who was uh, killed along with one of the insurgents. OK, there's actually there's actually about 140. I think it's about 140 officers uh, who were injured. Um, for comparison, on June 1st, 2020, in Washington, D.C., nearly 6,000 law enforcement, um, nearly 6,000 law enforcement officers ranging from ICE to uh, DEA, including National Guard helicopters, were mobilized to descend on the area for a Black Lives Matter protest. Over 300 people were arrested that night, 
uh, they never even got close to the Capitol or the White House. All right. So then it talks about anti-black hate groups who were involved in the Capitol riots, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, things like this. We'll continue this on the other side of the break. We'll let you uh, hear from President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. You listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by. Back from break in four minutes. How's everybody doing? Okay, we have three new, we're the African-American business owners. Supposed to name your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Okay, we have three new uh, advertising packages. This is the first time we've offered something like this. Our current promotion is buy one month, get two months free. Buy one month, get two months free. Let me pull this up here. This is a great way to start off 2022. Oh, hell, what is this doing? This is a great way to start off 2022. Okay, stand by. Let me bring this up here. All right. Give us a thumbs up if you like this broadcast, if you like this type of information. Back from breaking three minutes. Okay, stand by. Okay, um, African American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Email us at AHN Show at africanhistorynetwork.com we have three advertising packages starting at below 100 dollars. we have three advertising packages uh, you can advertise with the african history network um in, in your your ad or run when we rebroadcast these shows on our social media platforms and also on facebook and youtube the superstation detroit's only african-american talk radio Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Thursday, January 6, 2022. Okay, uh, we'll talk about this some more on uh, our show on Sunday. Sundays, we're on 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're on uh, for uh, two hours. But uh, go back and read this article also. Um, the... Uh, this is from blackamericaweb.com, the racist legacy of January 6th, okay? Uh, yes, Capitol rioters wanted to stop Joe Biden from being president, but the motivation was also largely rooted in anti-black racism. Now, this midterm election, all, all these elections have consequences. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, the adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. The, the elections are never about one person. We have to be smarter than this and understand this is about self-preservation and you have a concerted effort to take us back to 1890 what happened in 1890 1890 was when you had the mississippi state convention where they rewrote the mississippi state constitution and legalized poll taxes and literacy tests to suppress african-american voters who were the who were the majority of voters in mississippi at the time in 1890 and they were actually the majority of the population in mississippi also in 1890 you have a concerted effort to uh uh violate the u.s constitution violate norms okay operate based upon the big law operate based upon these conspiracy theories and take us back to 1890 
after Reconstruction ended in 1877, and you had a reversal of of of, of rights of African Americans, and you had a suppression uh, of our votes, and we were being voted out of elected office because there were about 2,000 African American men who got elected to uh, office during Reconstruction. Read this article here from the Washington Post. The Mississippi plan to keep blacks from voting in 1890. We came here to exclude the Negro. And that's what Solomon Saladin Calhoun said, who was the white county judge who presided over the uh, uh, Mississippi State Convention of 1890. OK, he said we came here to exclude the Negro. Because of what happened in 1890 and it was copied by other southern states. Rewriting their state constitutions to do the same thing. This is why you needed the Voting Rights Act in 1965. This is why you needed the Voting Rights Act in 1965. And you got people right now financed by white corporations that we spend money with who are trying to take us back to 1890. So we have to understand history, one, two, law, and understand politics and how the two intersect. This is not about one person. All right. I want to go to uh, this clip here. We're going to clip one, Kevin. This is uh, President Joe Biden putting the smack down today um, and really calling out Donald Trump without mis mentioning his name. Uh, this is from MSNBC. Biden slams Trump as defeated former president who spread election lies. Let's go to clip one. So let's speak plainly about what happened in 2020. Even before the first ballot was cast, the former president was preemptively sowing doubt about the election results. <clears throat> he built his lie over months. It wasn't based on any facts. He was just looking for an excuse, a pretext to cover for the truth. He's not just a former president. He's a defeated former president. Defeated by a margin of over 7 million of your votes in a full and free and fair election. There is simply zero proof the election results are inaccurate. In fact, in every venue where evidence had to be produced, an oath to tell the truth had to be taken, the former president failed to make his case. Think about this. Former president and his supporters have never been able to explain how they accept as accurate the other election results that took place on November 3rd. The elections for governor, United States Senate, House of Representatives. Elections which they closed the gap in the House. They challenged none of that. The president's name was first. Then we went down the line. Governors, senators, House of Representatives. Somehow those results are accurate on the same ballot. But the presidential race was flawed. And on the same ballot, the same day, cast by the same voters, the only difference, the former president didn't lose those races. He just lost the one that was his own. Finally, the third big lie being told by a former president and his supporters is that the mob who sought to impose their will through violence are the nation's two patriots. Is that what you thought? When you looked at the mob ransacking the Capitol, destroying property, literally defecating in the hallways, rifling through the desks of senators and representatives, hunting down members of Congress. Patriots? Not in my view. To me, the true patriots were the more than 150 Americans who peacefully expressed their vote at the ballot box. The election workers who protected the integrity of the vote. And the heroes who defended this capital. You can't love your country only when you win. You can't obey the law only when it's convenient. You can't be patriotic when you embrace and enable lies. Those who stormed this capital, and those who instigated and incited, and those who called on them to do so, held a dagger at the throat of America, at American democracy. They didn't come here out of patriotism or principle. 
They came here in rage, not in service of America, but rather in service of one man. Those who incited the mob, the real plotters who were desperate to deny the certification of this election, defy the will of the voters. But their plot was foiled. Congressmen, Democrats, Republicans stayed. Senators, representatives, staff, they finished their work the Constitution demanded. They honored their oath to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Look, folks, <clears throat> now it's up to all of us, to we the people, to stand for the rule of law, to preserve the flame of democracy, to keep the promise of America alive. All right, so that was a clip of uh, Joe Biden's speech today. Those watching on Facebook and YouTube, uh, keep watching. Uh, we're going to keep going on for a few more minutes. We're going to let you hear from uh, Vice President Kamala Harris uh, from today as well. This other information, well, I mean, we'll, we'll squeeze in uh, this piece here dealing with uh, the sun, the sundial uh, found in Egypt. Uh, Sun Temple found in Egypt dates back about 4,500 years ago. We'll squeeze that in also. Okay, uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Register for the online courses I teach on Saturdays and Sundays from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968, and Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, uh, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay. We got to get out of here. Remember, right now is correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. All right, stand by. Let me pull this up here. Um, okay. Um, okay, so I want to go to, uh, let me cue, cue up this clip here of uh, Vice President Kamala Harris speaking today as well. All right. Uh, read this piece from uh, NBC News. Read this article here from uh, NBC News. Um, Biden condemns lies of defeated former president as an attack on America's soul. OK, so check that out. Let me. Uh, I want to pull up this picture here also. Let's see here. Okay, African American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Email us at AHN show at African History And uh, we'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. We have three new uh, advertising packages also. All right. Uh, I'm trying to see where did that go. Okay, uh, let me cue up this other clip here. So Vice President Kamala Harris uh, spoke as well today uh, on Capitol Hill to mark the anniversary of, Jan of the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol and describe how the events of that day reflected the fragility and strength of American democracy. Now, something else that we found out today in Politico.com uh, has an a article on this. Um, the pipe bombs... The pipe bombs that were at the uh, DNC headquarters. Okay, stand by. Okay, the pipe bombs that were at the DNC that were at that were at the DNC headquarters, placed at the DNC headquarters. Uh, we found out today that Vice President Com Vice President Elect Kamala Harris was actually at the DNC headquarters when the pipe bombs were placed there. Uh, political has an article dealing with this. Uh, Harris was inside DNC on January 6th when pipe bomb was discovered outside. That's a uh, reporting from uh, political.com. And let's see if we can pull this up here.
All right, and uh, let me go to this uh, clip here of um, Vice President Kamala Harris speaking. that okay stand by just a second i got the to queue this up and where'd that clip go all right so, okay here we go i gotta close some of these uh tabs and uh google chrome when I meet with young people, they often ask about the state of our democracy, about January 6th. And what I tell them is January 6th reflects the dual nature of democracy, its fragility and its strength. You see, the strength of democracy is the rule of law. The strength of democracy is the principle that everyone should be treated equally, that elections should be free and fair, that corruption should be given no quarter. The strength of democracy is that it empowers the people. And the fragility of democracy is this, that if we are not vigilant, if we do not defend it, democracy simply will not stand. It will falter and fail. The violent assault that took place here, the very fact how close we came to an election overturned, that reflects the fragility of democracy. Yet, the resolve I saw in our elected leaders when I returned to the Senate chamber that night, their resolve not to yield, but to certify the election, their loyalty not to party or person, to the Constitution of the United States, that reflects its strength. And so, of course, does the heroism of the Capitol Police the D.C. Metropolitan Police Department, the National Guard, and other law enforcement officers who answered the call that day, including those who later succumbed to wounds, both visible and invisible. Our thoughts are with all of the families who have lost a loved one. You know, I wonder, how will January 6th come to be remembered in the years ahead? Will it be remembered as a moment that accelerated the unraveling of the oldest, greatest democracy in the world? Or a moment when we decided to secure and strengthen our democracy for generations to come? The American spirit is being tested. The answer to whether we will meet that test resides where it always has resided in our country, with you, people. Okay, so that was from, um, that's an excerpt from the speech today. That's from um, MSNBC. Um, Harris, January 6th, showed the fragility and strength of our democracy. Uh, you can watch that on uh, MSNBC's uh, website. Okay. Let me... Um, all right. Uh, I want to squeeze in this other part, and I'm trying to bring up this picture. I don't know why this stuff is not coming up. Read that article from Politico.com that deals with the pipe bomb that was placed at uh, DNC headquarters. Um, uh, 
And this was the pipe bomb place that uh, uh, DNC headquarters. That's an article from Politico.com from today. So we just found out that um, information today that um, Vice President, at the time, Vice President elect Kamala Harris was inside uh, DNC headquarters on January 6th when pipe bomb was discovered. Let me uh, pull this back up here. Uh, the then vice president elects presence inside the building while a bomb was right outside raises sobering questions about her security that day. Now, this article is from uh, January 6, 2022. Then vice president Kamala Harris was inside the Democratic uh, National Committee headquarters on January 6, 2021, when a pipe bomb was discovered outside the building, according to four people familiar familiar with her movements uh that day capitol police began investigating the pipe bomb at 107 p.m uh according to an official capitol uh police timeline of events obtained by politico the timeline says that uh capitol police and the secret service evacuated an unarmed protectee an unarmed protectee at approximately Vice President elect Kamala Harris was the Secret Service protectee identified in the timeline, which has circulated on Capitol Hill. Now, um, Harris' presence inside the building while a bomb was right outside raises sobering questions about her security that day. It also raises the chilling prospect that the riots could have been far more destructive. The riots could have, the insurrection could have been far more destructive than they already were when the incoming vice president's life, uh, with the incoming vice president's life directly endangered. Federal law enforcement officials have faced harsh criticism for failing to anticipate uh, the chaotic scene around the Electoral College certification one year ago, despite receiving a host of warnings about possible chaos. All right, read the rest of this here from Politico, politico.com. Harris was inside DNC on January 6th when pipe bomb was discovered outside. All right, now. Okay. Now, uh, I want to go to uh, I, I want to squeeze this clip in here. This is from uh, today on Deadline White House with Nicole Wallace. And she spoke with um, uh, she spoke with Dr. Donnell Harbin, okay, PhD, and I, I've seen interviews with him before. He's a former uh, chief of Homeland Security and Intelligence for Washington D.C., and he put out warnings about the January 6th insurrection before it happened, okay, but his warnings were not heeded. Also, in this clip is Frank Figluzzi who is a former FBI assistant director for counterintelligence. And let's cue this up here. All right. The only way we'll truly move forward from January 6th is by speaking truth to power. We cannot avoid it. The truth about what happened that day, about what led to the violence. What we must do instead is stare the truth, however ugly, in the face the attack of january 6th didn't come out of the blue 
As Majority Leader Chuck Schumer on the Senate floor today, part of that truth, obviously, is a massive intelligence and security failure in the weeks and days before. Today, a January 6th Select Committee aide tells NBC News its designated blue team is quietly examining thousands of documents and looking closely at what was missed or not assessed from the intelligence that was apparent before January 6th. Meanwhile, some current and former officials argue that the sheer volume of information, regardless of how dependable or specific, should have been enough. That includes Janelle Harvin, who warned federal agencies days before about what he saw coming. What he said on this program, he didn't need to be an intelligence agent to predict. Harvin tells NBC News today, quote, what there was was a lot of not credible, not specific information that should have prompted a response, not necessarily knocking on someone's door or getting a subpoena, but it should have prompted a response at the federal level. Joining us now is Danelle Harvin, former chief of Homeland Security and Intelligence for Washington, D.C., and our friend Frank Figluzzi, former assistant director for counterintelligence at the FBI, as well as an MSNBC national security analyst. Claire and Heilman are still around. Um, Danelle, we've, we've talk i mean your your words about wanting to make sure the hospitals had enough blood on supply for a mass casualty event to me are the whole story of what you one security official knew was possible when you look at where we are one year later do you feel like there would be more than just you who would know what was possible if an event like january 6th were in the planning stages again well I don't think we would experience January 6th again like we did a year ago. I think the threat has evolved and it's changed. Um, I, I can't say that a lot of the signs that were missed before, I believe that the intelligence and Homeland Security Enterprise is looking at, they're analyzing that information and, they, and they're looking at ways to get better after January 6th. Um, but there's certainly a, a a possibility, and this is my concern, that we're so busy looking in the rearview mirror of what happened last year that we're not looking at the threat that's in front of us and we're going to bump right into it. And what does that threat look like now that's in front of us? Well, the, the threat is that the ideology, the blended and mixed ideologies that came together at the Capitol this time last year um, are still together. Uh, they're still plotting they're still just as effective and operationally sound as they were on January 6th. And they've just basically blended back into the states. And so instead of waiting for the very last moment to affect an election, uh, the analysis suggests that the battle is going to be back at the states. Now, consider the fact that if the federal government wasn't prepared for what happened on January 6th, what's the state and local authorities going to be prepared for? I mean, Frank, we talk about this a lot in the context of the fraud. It's. We talk about it in the context of threats to school board members. We talk about it in the context of ongoing efforts to strip election officials of authority and replace them with um, folks who see the world the way uh, the twice impeached ex-president sees them. What has, if, if anything, what has scaled at a state and local level to respond to where the threats have moved out to? Excellent question, because we are looking at what I would call an entrenched insurgency at this point, a decentralized insurgency, meaning, you know, it's no longer an emergent threat. And you can't say, well, well we're going to stop the three percenters and the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers. Um, there's a lot of accountability taking place right now in the form of over 700 uh, indictments. And that is having an effect. But the effect, as we've just learned, is that it, people are saying, I don't want to get arrested at the Capitol. I'm going to go local. And that is a strategy now. And it's melding with people in suits and ties who go, yep, we're, we are going local. We're taking over through violent threats, often, by the way, electoral uh, officials and processes. So what's changed? At the state, county, and local level with law enforcement and intelligence, I have to tell you, not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. And so everybody's looking to the feds, the FBI, the DHS. They got to get it right next time. They got to get it right. Well, I have to tell you, and I have a column out on this topic today in MSNBC Daily. Who's got to get it right next time? Largely the state and locals with lots of support and intelligence sharing by DHS and FBI. Because next time's unlikely to be at the Capitol. Hopefully we're going to have security in place. That's a physical security thing. I'm talking about an intelligence thing. I'm talking about a different way of looking at the threat and risk moving forward. 
can we be really explicit too, Frank, about what that threat is moving forward and how we communicate? You know, the, the forces that came to the Capitol on that day were described by Congressman Raskin as, you know, the outer two rings were all the supporters of Donald Trump who came to the Capitol, went into it, participated in the insurrection, but also the extremist groups who were more organized. And you see that in the different charges. Some of those members have been charged with conspiracies. How do local law enforcement agencies sort of differentiate between the one-offs and the organized militia members in their localities? Well, and, and let me let me add to that challenge by uh, what we've all always talked about, which is the kind of threat within the ranks of, of radicalized law enforcement that still um, represents uh, it well in the defense among the defendants for the January 6th violence. So it's it's quite a challenge. Intelligence has to get better. So when you're talking about county and state police organizations, yes, they have intelligence units, some of them quite sophisticated in major um, locations, but mostly not mostly not and the counties we're talking about some of the states we're talking about don't have them so you know I, we talked about the the mantra of defund the police being just a horrible message well it's a horrible reality because quite honestly what all of us need from local and state law enforcement actually is going to cost more money and and if i were looking at grants and dhs funding i'd be looking at beefing up intelligence units and getting them trained up on what the extremist threat looks like right now and how to get out in front of it we need that and then we really need a change. You know, we're talking about what's changed or not. Look, people ask me constantly, um, the FBI gonna gonna get get better at this. Well, mm. what's changed? What where where's the law? Where's the the AG guidelines, the, the DOJ guidelines that govern how the FBI conducts domestic terror operations? Not there's no change there. It, it's it's a change in mindset. Oh, something's terrible happened. We're gonna get better. We're gonna share intel with locals now. We're gonna get out in front of threats on social media. That's not that's a mindset change. It's not it's not a legal change. It's not a technique change. And until that happens, I remain um, not very confident that we've got the tools necessary. All right. That was from uh, Deadline White House today. That was. Uh, Dr. Do Donnell Harbin. OK, Ph.D. And that was uh, Frank Ficluzzi. Frank Ficluzzi is a former um a, a former fbi assistant director hold on just a second here just a minute here okay uh frank figluzzi is a, a former assistant director for counterintelligence for the fbi and uh dr donnell harvin is a former uh, chief of homeland security and intelligence for washington dc and uh, I, I have seen previous interviews that Dr. Donnell Harvin has done, and he was sounding the alarm about what could happen on January 6th. And he was looking at threats that were, even though they were not specific threats, they would uh, cause uh, alarm and cause you to uh, be on guard, okay? This piece here, he's, he's uh, interviewed in this piece here from uh, NBC News. January 6th committee examines FBI DHS documents for answers on intel failure. This is written by uh, Ken Delanian, who covers um, um, uh, intelligence and counterintelligence, things like this for uh, NBC and MSNBC. Uh, what there was was a lot of not credible, not specific information that should have prompted a response, that should have prompted a response, not, necess not necessarily knocking on someone's door or getting a subpoena, but it should have prompted a response at the federal level. OK, now this was the warning from Dr. Donnell Harbin. OK. Um, and I just want to pull this article up because I read this uh, piece before from uh, NBC News. Let's see. January 6th committee. Oh, 
pull this one up. This is the same uh, documents or answers until failure. Is this the one from Ken Delaney? Okay. Yeah, this is. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. This 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 piece came out today. This is the one that came out today. Okay, and it starts out. So if we look at this uh, article very quickly here. Uh, yeah, he covers national security. Ken Delaney covers uh, national security for uh, NBC News and MSNBC. January 6th committee examines FBI, DHS, Department of Homeland Security documents um, for answers on intel failure. The blue team is quietly examining thousands of internal documents that shed new light on what officials did and did not know before the Capitol riot. So this is from January 6, 2022. Two things were clear to Dr. Donnell Harvin, the Homeland Security and Intelligence Chief for Washington, D.C. in the weeks before January 6, 2021. One, was that a large number of people, including extremists with histories of violence, had vowed on social media to take weapons to, to his city to protest the ceremonial congressional certification of Joe Biden's electoral victory. And the other thing that Dr. Donnell Harvin knew was uh, the other uh, what was that federal agencies, the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security, did not seem very concerned about it. The FBI and the Department of Homeland Security did not seem very concerned about it. The federal security planning during that time focused on the coming inauguration, Dr. Donnell Harvin said. Quote, and if they mentioned January 6th in one of these meetings, that would be a footnote. If they mentioned January 6th in one of these meetings, that would be a footnote. The House Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol has twice interviewed Dr. Donnell Harvin as part of its effort, as part of its effort to get to the bottom of the biggest domestic security failure since 9-11. On the anniversary of the riots last insurrection, committee aides said they are moving closer to unlocking a mystery. How did the agencies tasked, tasked with stopping terrorist violence let the heart of the U.S. government be overrun by a domestic terrorist mob of thugs and insurrectionists, etc.? Dr. Donnell Harvin said, quote, you didn't need to be an intelligence analyst to understand what was coming. You did not need to be an intelligence analyst to understand what was coming. OK, so he said, uh, now he has uh, he has left the government to join the Rand Corporation think tank. Okay, he said, "Quote my daughter, who doesn't work uh, in intelligence, texted me several days before January sixth. Quote: Is it going to be safe to you? Uh, is it going to be safe to you uh, to, to go there? Is it going to be safe for you to go there? Do you see?" Uh, do you see what what there's what they're saying online? OK, is it going to be safe for you to go there? Do you see what they're saying online? This is what his uh, this is what his daughter um, texted him. Now, while the headlines have been filled in recent months with news of committee subpoenas to rec to recalcitrant witnesses from Benedict Donald's orbit, investigators 
have quietly obtained thousands of pages of documents from the Justice Department, the FBI, and DHS, Department of Homeland Security. Committee aides say, many of which were not available to the uh, Senate Homeland Security Committee when it published a report in June of 2021 about security and response failures. The documents committee aides and other officials familiar with them say shed new light questions that have been only partly answered so far, including what intelligence came into the FBI, DHS, and other agencies in the weeks before January 6th, why no formal bulletin was issued, and why more wasn't done to make sure the Capitol Police uh, understood and were prepared for the gravity of the threat. Okay, so inside the January 6th committee, which has been doing, they've interviewed over 300 people. They have 35 pages of documents to go over. Uh, they've, um, uh, they've issued uh, a number of subpoenas as well. So the January 6th committee is ramping up and really exposing how intricate this plan was. Uh, a green team is following the money and investigating the people who funded, which is extremely important, investigating the people who funded uh, the rallies that preceded the riot, while a gold team, this is all on the January 6th committee, and different people on the committee are responsible for different things. There's a blue team, a green team, and a gold team. The green team is following the money and investigating the people who funded the rallies, while the gold team is examining Donald Trump's efforts to try to overturn the election, committee aides said. The people inv investigating the intelligence and security shortcomings are dubbed the blue team. And you're going to start seeing public hearings very soon from the January 6th committee. Now, one of the reasons why Republicans want to take back control of the House of Representatives is to shut down this January 6th committee because many of these Republicans are going to be implicated in all this stuff that comes out. Some of them already have been. And they want to shut this down before they get exposed. See, there's, there's, there's a lot of Republicans in the House, some in the Senate, but especially in the House, that were involved in orchestrating this. And they were, they were involved in inciting the insurrection. They want to shut down the investigation before they get exposed okay so read that article also from nbc news okay um i want to go very quickly here to uh this article here uh we'll take a quick commercial break and uh we'll be back in just a second here um african-american business owners post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast how's everybody doing we have uh, new advertising packages, three new advertising packages with the African History Network. So we have low cost ways for you to market your business. Uh, we take your 30 second, 60 second commercial, put into the uh, rebroadcast of these shows on our social media platforms, uh, including our Facebook fan page where we have 1 million followers. We also upload your commercial to our fan page as well. People get a lot of traction from that. We also have a package where we, we put that information into our Facebook stories because the, the posts we do in our Facebook stories on our fan page gets thousands of views. Uh, and then we're on 10 different audio podcast platforms, Facebook podcast, iTunes, iHeartRadio, FM Player, TuneIn. And we put your uh, uh, commercial uh, in some of these packages, you put your commercial into the audio podcast of the broadcast as well. Okay. So... Uh, email us at ahn show at african history network.com ahn show at african history network.com and we'll let you know how you can uh, advertise with the african history network so we have uh this is uh this uh, the current promotion is buy one month get two months free it's going on for a very very limited time because we have limited ad space
Okay, I'm going to post this information here. Okay, yep, so email me and I'll get right back with you and we can get you up and running. Okay, uh, this this article here, and I saw this back uh, November 17th, and I've been so busy I haven't had a chance to get to this. And some of these articles I want to talk about, I've been going back through looking at them and printing them up as well and i put them in a file folder um to make sure that uh, i get a chance to discuss these so if you uh have taken the online course i teach on uh sundays ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school you know i deal with how these um archaeological discoveries come out every other week um out of africa and uh this is this is one of them here uh let me close this out okay this one right here from uh cnn archaeologists say they've uh, found a lost 4,500 year old sun temple, a lost 4,500 year old sun temple in Egypt. Okay. This is from November 17th, 2021. Now archeologists have uncovered what they believe to be one of Egypt's lost sun temples dating from uh, the mid 25th uh, century BCE before the common era. Okay, the team uncovered uh, remains buried, uh, 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 buried beneath another temple, uh, Abu Ghraib around 12 miles south of Cairo uh, mission co-director uh, Nazolo and assistant professor of Egyptology at the Polish Academy of Sciences Institute for Mediterranean and Oriental Cultures in Warsaw, Warsaw, Poland, uh, told CNN on Monday back in uh, November 2021. Now, Nazolo and the team's discovery featured in the show Lost Treasures of Egypt, Lost Treasures of Egypt, on National Geographic, uh, which aired uh, in November 2021. Now, in 1898, archaeologists working at the site discovered the Sun Temple of Nusera, also known as Nusair, uh, the sixth king of the fifth dynasty. Okay, the sixth king of the fifth dynasty who ruled Egypt. Uh, who ruled Kemet between 2400 and, 20, and 2370 BCE before the common era. Okay, now uh, the temple was discovered belief beneath a later sun temple. Here's this picture of them here making the discovery. Um, now discoveries made during the latest mission suggest that it was built on top of the remains of another sun temple built on top of the remains of another sun temple the the archaeologists of the 19th century excavated only a very small part of the mud bricks uh of the mud bricks building uh below the stone temple of nusera and concluded that this was uh, a previous building phase of the same temple. Now, our finds demonstrate that this was a completely different building erected before uh, uh, Nesubiti Nusera or Pharaoh Nusera. The finds include seals engraved with the names of uh, Nesubitis or Pharaohs who ruled before Nusera which were once used as jar stoppers, jar, jar stoppers, as well as the basis of two limestone 
limestone columns, which were part of an entrance portico and a limestone threshold. The original construction was made entirely of mud bricks, whose, uh, uh, said Nusello, whose team also found dozens of intact beer jars during the dig. Now, uh, let me see here. There's another part of this here. Okay. All right. That's it. Okay. There's another discovery out of Egypt we'll talk about Sunday. But check this out here. Archaeologists say they found a lost 4,500-year-old sun temple in Egypt. Okay, these discoveries come out every other week. The deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. And these archaeological discoveries, like I've said before, and if, you, um, if, if you've if you been in my online class, we, we talk about this. These discoveries are not hidden. This is CNN. All, all you do is just Google this topic. All the news outlets have stories on this. It's not hidden. It's just not as prominent as like nonsense okay that's projected but all, all the news outlets have stories on this okay visit our website africanhistorynetwork.com africanhistorynetwork.com um in addition to uh the online courses i teach on saturdays and sundays uh that you can register for right now we also have uh the uh, my 15 dvd bundle pack the michael m hotep uh black history month bundle pack you know uh, African American History Month is coming up. This bundle pack is good any time of the year. It's 15 of my lectures uh, on sale for only $100. So in this bundle pack, very quickly here, you'll get three of my presentations dealing with the film Black Panther. Um, you'll get this one here dealing with the history of um, African American History Month. Uh, breaking the chains while we celebrate African American History Month, exposing the myths and I deal with the origins of Black History Month. We talk about Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, founded September 9th, 1915 in Chicago. Um, we deal with dispelling myths about our history, why the Black John Hanson was not president and uh, why the Emancipation Proclamation did not free the slaves, things like this. So this is a three hour presentation. This is one of the uh, uh, 15, uh, presentations that you'll get in this bundle pack. Uh, also you'll get, uh, this almost three hour lecture I did dealing with the film, Black Panther, Black Panther analysis, African culture, history, and, uh, Black Panther analysis, African culture, history, and Afro future, Afro futurism. And I deal with how the film Black Panther relates to, uh, African history, African culture, um, African language, uh african spiritual systems things like this okay the movie is a deep movie on multiple levels i had to do a lot of research to um be able to do my lectures dealing with the film uh black panther also okay so that is uh that's one of the uh lectures that you get in the bundle pack as well then we have in any of these you can order individually from our website, but it's a better value in the bundle pack. Um, you also get this one here, Malcolm X 50 years later, why is he still relevant? So we deal some with Malcolm's impact on uh, conscious hip hop. Uh, we deal with different aspects of Malcolm's life. So this is a really good presentation I did in Lansing, Michigan back in 2017. Um, then this one here, the distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The revolutionary will not be televised on the television. The revolutionary will not be televised on the television. So this dispels a lot of myths about Dr. King and deals with the revolutionary Dr. King, which is usually not the Dr. King that we see talked about on Dr. King Day. It's not going to be the Dr. King that you see. Um, a lot of Republicans talk about on Dr. King Day, okay, when, when when they try to dismantle his legacy, vote against the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, vote against the Freedom to Vote Act, things like this. 
Okay, then they're going to come out and praise. Uh, then they're going to come out and praise Dr. King on, on Dr. King Day and talk about content of the, the uh, 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 of their character. You know, judge a person by the by the not by their skin color, but the content of their character. Things like this. Take Dr. King totally out of context because that was part of his speech that was originally called uh, "Normalcy Never Again," and then it was called a cancel check. Then years later it was called i have a dream because the speech was not about a dream but these people don't study dr king and they only can quote like one line from dr king or something like that they won't even quote from i've been to the mountaintop where he says we have to always anchor our external direct action with the power of economic withdrawal they won't even deal with things like this so this deals with the revolutionary dr king that they don't talk about on the television the dr king who tried to get a concealed pistol license in Montgomery, Alabama in 1956 during the Montgomery bus boycott and his house was firebombed twice during the Montgomery bus boycott. Okay, so they don't want to deal with this. The Dr. King who eventually used the Deacons for Defense and Justice sometimes as his security and they were armed with guns. Uh, the other, uh, another lecture you get is lessons from the film Black Panther. So I deal with how do we take different themes from the film black panther that we see and how we use that for economic and political empowerment lessons from the film black panther economic guerrilla warfare political self-defense and how to wakanda the vote economic guerrilla warfare political self-defense and how to wakanda the vote all right so uh that's another one that you get let me see i didn't have to close that out all right um then this one right here, the Three-Fifths Compromise of 1787 and the Electoral College, which is extremely, extremely important because, unfortunately, many of our people don't understand either one of them. And one of the first things we really need to do is read the U.S. Constitution and understand it and go to LOC.gov, Library of Congress website, and House.gov. Um and read the u.s constitution because if you read the u.s constitution a lot of this other stuff will start falling into place but this deals with article one section two clause three of the u.s constitution called the three-fifths compromise that a lot of people really don't understand it did not say we were three-fifths of the human being it says for the purpose of taxation and apportionment it's saying three-fifths of the population of those in bondage would be counted and that's to determine how many seats in the u.s house of representatives these slaveholding states are going to have so i go through and really break this down and go through and break down how the electoral college works and uh why the popular vote does matter people will say oh the popular vote doesn't matter no it does matter you just don't understand how it matters it's not the overall popular vote that matters it's the popular vote per state that matters because how do you determine uh how, how do you win the elect electoral college votes associated with a state? You win the electoral college votes associated with a state by winning the popular votes in the state. And that's how you get the electoral college votes in the state. Okay. Um, so when you look at the 2016 presidential election, I think it took place November 8th, Donald Trump became president elect the morning of November 9th. Well, it's because he reached 270 electoral college votes. But the electoral college didn't vote until the first Monday following the second Wednesday in December, which fell, if I remember correctly, on December 19th. But he won the popular votes associated with the states, with each state, and that he got, he exceeded 270 electoral college votes to become president elect. It's the popular vote per state that matters, not the overall popular vote nationwide. It's the popular vote per state that matters. But many of our people don't know this or don't understand this. And they listen to people on social media who have no clue and, and they're not explaining this to them. Now, Republicans understand this. This is why Republicans engage in mass, massive voter suppression campaigns in, in key battleground states because they understand this. Many of our people don't understand this. 
So Trump won Michigan by 10,704 votes and won the 16 electoral college votes associated with Michigan. He won Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin by 78,000 electoral college votes. So the only people who say that the popular vote doesn't matter are people who don't understand the Constitution and don't read, because Republicans are not saying that. They know the electoral college vote is directly related to the popular vote. It's related to the popular vote per state, which is why Trump wanted to put a citizenship question on the 2020 census to, to weaken democratic leaning states that have a higher percentage of, of immigrants okay whether whether documented or undocumented and a lot of a lot of immigrants that are here undocumented came here legally but they just overstayed their visas but he knew that by putting a citizen citizenship question on the 2020 census then even uh you have some you have some immigrants who are here legally but they may stay in a household with somebody here who's undocumented they may have overstayed their visas here or they may have come here and 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 never had uh never came here legally okay but he knew that by by putting that citizenship question on the uh census it would drive down the population in key democratic leaning states and how many seats in the house of representatives states have is directly tied to the population count in the census so michigan lost population count in the 2020 census and we lost a seat in the house of representatives which means we lost a electoral college vote so we go from michigan goes from 16 to 15 electoral college votes the state of new york lost one electoral college vote uh and if 89 if if a total of 89 more people had have been counted in the census for the state of new york they would have maintained that one electoral college seat that they just lost as soon as i heard that trump wanted to put a citizenship question on the census and it hasn't been a citizenship question on the census in about 70 years i knew exactly what he was trying to do that's what i was warning people about in 2016 when people thought this was just, just about one person because you don't understand history law or politics i was warning people in 2016 months before the election that this fool has to be stopped because i i saw what we what he was trying to do all of this is connected this presentation here 13 forms of wealth and redistributing the pain keys to economic empowerment and entrepreneurship for African Americans. So I've taught entrepreneurship for seven years, my degrees in business administration, vision marketing, and I deal with 13 um, key traits that successful African American entrepreneurs need to have. Okay. So we deal with this in, the, in this presentation here. uh then you also get let's see here um uh, oh this one the racist history of the white national anthem and the pledge of allegiance really really good presentation and i tie all this into i deal with the history of the, the the pledge of allegiance history of the national anthem and francis scott francis scott key september 19 uh, 1814 during the war of 1812. i taught tie all of this into colin kaepernick's protests and deal with the history of colin kaepernick's protests and I still have not watched the NFL game since Kaepernick left the league, including the Super Bowl. Uh, this is a double lecture I did with my friend, Dr. David M. Hotep, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. He did this here in Detroit a few years ago. So he dealt with his research in The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. And uh, I dealt with uh, great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. This is a double lecture we did together. This is a four hour presentation, redistributing the pain, how African Americans fought back with economic boycotts, redistributing the pain, how African Americans fought back with economic boycotts. And this deals with 
uh, documented examples of us using different types of economic withdrawal strategies to fight back against white supremacy and racism. You're redistributing the pain. Uh, this is uh, the light of ancient Kemet awakens the, um, I don't know why this isn't blowing up like I wanted to, the light of ancient Kemet awakens the African mind to economic empowerment. I did this, uh, this is during African American history month of 2017. This one corrects a lot of misinformation about the Tuskegee experiment of untreated syphilis in the Negro male, which lasted uh, about 40 years. It was supposed to last six to nine months. It lasted from uh, about 1933 to 1973. Um, contrary to popular belief, they did not inject them with syphilis. There were 600 men in the study, 399 had an early form of syphilis called latent syphilis. The other 201 did not have syphilis they were the control group it was a bad study but there's a lot of misinformation floating around i'm not sure why there's a bunch of misinformation floating around unless people don't do research i don't i don't know uh but we deal with we deal with this uh in this presentation go through and really break down what it was and then uh i also talk about the mustard gas experiment during world war ii that was done on african-american soldiers where they where they were exposed to mustard gas Okay, uh, you get that one and you get great African women in history, the mothers of civilization, where I deal with some well known and not so well known African women in our history from all different time periods. That's a four hour presentation, great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. Then you get uh, some other presentations as well, uh, including ancient Kemet, the winter solstice and the history of Christmas, which is a three hour presentation. We deal with the pre-Christian origins of, of uh, Christmas. Uh, we do it a saw set in heru all of that information okay so that is a uh, 15 dvd black history month bundle pack and there are a couple other presentations in there as well including this one right here where i go through break all this stuff down dealing with trump and the voter suppression that took place in the 2016 election african-american resistance in the era of donald trump voter suppression reparations and how elections have consequences and i go through step by step and break all this stuff down why there were 868 fewer polling places in the 2016 presidential election, how that was tied to Shelby County versus Holder 2013 U.S. Supreme Court case, which gutted Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act of, of, of 1965. You needed the 1965 Voting Rights Act because of what happened to Mississippi in, in, at the Mississippi State Convention in 1890. I deal with how all this is connected that brings us up right to where we are right now. And then if we understood Richard Nixon in 1968, who won the presidential election in 68 and Richard Nixon was against civil rights and he was a backlash to the civil rights movement and the black power movement. If we understand Nixon in 68, we will understand Trump in 2016 and we would have stopped him because, because Trump was a backlash to two terms of president Barack Obama. He was a backlash to the black lives matter movement, just like uh, Richard Nixon was a backlash to the uh, black power movement. Richard Nixon in, in 1968 ran on the platform of law and order and lo and behold, Donald Trump, in 2016, part of his platform was what? Law and order. So this, this is what happens when you don't understand history, law, or politics. So that's a 15 DVD bundle pack. It's right on the homepage of our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Um, you can um, create, uh, you can use these in study groups. You can use these in home schools. Um, if you want me to do a presentation during African American History Month for your group or organization, email me. I just got a, a request to speak in. I'm speaking at a college out of state in um, for Dr. King Day on the 17th. So I got to get with them in the morning because I'll be flying out of town on the 16th. Um, but when you scroll down past the information about the uh, online classes that I teach, this right here. Um, 15 dvd bundle pack black history month bundle pack and that's on sale right now uh 100 if you want it in digital download format let me know okay email me at ahn show at african history network.com 
but we have this information here at the um, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for it now. I mean, you can uh, order it right now. We have these shipping out this week. I'm going to post the um, information here again. Okay, so we appreciate the support. This helps us stay on the air, keep doing the research, stay on, uh, keep broadcasting because uh, I do radio five, six days a week. I don't get paid to do radio. The station doesn't pay me to do radio. I do Roller Martin Unfiltered. I don't get paid to be, most of the stuff I do, I don't get paid to do none of this stuff. That's why I got to sell my lectures and classes and all this stuff. I don't get, most of the stuff I don't get paid to do. So we appreciate the support. Look, we got to get out of here because this has been almost two hours. Um, I'll be on Roller Martin Unfiltered on Friday. So check that out, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll talk about it on my Sunday show. Uh, remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And if you uh, if you want to support the African History Network, also dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal. PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. Okay. And this is our official Cash App account here. Let me pull this up. Um, because uh, when you go to it, it says Michael and shows my picture there. These other ones here are fake African History Network Cash App accounts. I don't know who set these up. It wasn't me. All right, this right here. Let me pull this up. Okay, email me, uh, Cleveland, and we can we can get you taken care of. I'll post the email address here. I'm trying to go to another platform. Uh, I'm running into some problems with the hosting company. Uh, so this is our official uh, Cash App account here. Dollar sign the AHN show through uh, Cash App. Okay. Uh, so if anybody has any problems uh checking out or anything like that uh like order uh, placing the order or checking out uh email me at ahn show at africanhistorynetwork.com we'll post the link here or we'll post the email address here and i can get you taken care of we can we can um make it easy for you and we can do it uh if you want to uh process do if you want to do it through cash out we can do that as well just a second here. Where is that? Okay. All right. Yeah. Just email me right here. AHN show at African history network.com. And we'll get you taken care of. Okay. We have to get out of here. Remember the African history network. You focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now it's correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace. Health and well-being have long been a taboo subject in the so-called African-American community. So I enlisted the help of mental health experts, thought leaders, and activists to help kill the ghost of Willie Lynch and heal from post-traumatic slave syndrome. We experience trauma a lot of times um, on a subconscious level. So sometimes something happens to us and we know that it's traumatizing, but we don't really recognize the extent of the trauma. Soul in Motion, celebrating 38 years in the arts. This energetic ensemble of dancers and drummers was started by percussionist Michael Friend and is led by choreographer, associate director Pam Lassiter. Based in the Washington, D.C. area, Soul in Motion is now accepting bookings for Black History Month, Juneteenth, and summer festivals in 2022. Soul in Motion is also available for more intimate events like naming ceremonies and weddings. To find out more or book your date, call 240-452-1349 or send an email to info at soulinmotion.org. Be sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Soul in Motion, celebrating our history, our culture, our future. Soul in Motion, theater, African dance, and drumming 
since 1984.